righty. Well, when I was a kid, I had really bad dreams. Now, maybe you've had some bad dreams in your day as well. Uh, specifically, I, rem- uh, I don't remember exactly all of the dreams, but my mom would say that I would wake up and I would be sitting up and I would be drenched in sweat and I would like look at her. She would run to the room and I'd look at her, but I'd be asleep. My eyes would be open. And I'd be having these, these horrible nightmares. And um, for the longest time, I didn't know what to do about it. My mom didn't know what to do about it. And I just had these nightmares over and over and over again. And my grandfather, he was a, a, a very spiritually eclectic kind of guy. Um, he you know, had a Mormon background and everything, but he also uh, was into uh, uh, Asian spiritualism and, and Buddhist type stuff, but also uh, Native American type stuff as well. So that's why I said it's very weirdly eclectic and contradictory. So that he was an interesting guy. And uh, when I kept having these nightmares, he gave me this dream catcher, right? And he said that if I was to put this up on my wall, that I would no longer have any bad dreams. And it seemed to work. It seemed to do really good for a long time. I thought, okay, you know, I I got this up and I'll do it. And then, so I I always had this up for the longest time. Had it in my bedroom growing up. Uh, When I moved to New York, it was up in my dorms, up in the room there. And, uh, And then just by habit, I even Put it in our house when Laura and I were first married. She said, what is that? So it's my dream catcher. It catches my dreams. You know, it's like a fly catcher, but different. <laughs> <laughs> and so I always had it hanging up. And, and after thinking about it for a while, I, I, eventually I did take it down. I couldn't get rid of it, though, because, you know, it has all those memories and stuff attached to it. But that's one of those things that it seemed to help me for a time and I seemed to be okay with it. It was kind of a superstitious thing, right? And that's what I want to talk about today is is how there are lots of things that we do in life that maybe are not necessarily guided or directed by truth, but mostly guided and directed by superstition, guided and directed by myth, by old wise tales, by whatever we want to call it, right? There's all kinds of different things that we hear that really are superstitions or myths or tales that become common. So like we have these types of things, right? And these are ones that we all know. Friday the 13th, right? Is that good or is that bad? Well, it's bad. We just had one. Didn't we just have one? Just this month. There you go. Did you guys do okay that, that day? Survive? All right. What about, uh, oh, the umbrella. What happens if you open up umbrella inside? Not good, right? Black cat crosses your path, you shoot it, right? Is that how it goes? Something like that. What happens if you break a mirror? Seven years, years, bad luck, right? Do do we walk under ladders? No. No. Uh, What about, uh, what's this one? Knock on wood, right? We do this one too, sometimes. (laughs) Right? These are things that just become popular. They, they, they become known. It's just a, a fun thing that, that people say. Um, you spill salt. You, you, know, you throw salt over your shoulder. That's good luck. Different things like that. But then we also have uh, uh, ones in different areas. Like uh, People always will say, if, if uh, you're pregnant, if you want it to be a boy or you want it to be a girl... Everybody will tell you all these different things in order to, to make it be a boy or a girl, right? You eat this kind of food and not that kind of food. Or they always say, if, uh, what's the one about heartburn? If you have heartburn more, then it's going to be a boy or a lot of hair, right? Is that true? I don't think any of us know, but you probably have heard somebody say that. You probably said it yourself, right? There's a lot of things that are superstitions that we kind of attach to and we don't question some of these things, you've, you've been, you heard it your whole life and you just never questioned it. I heard it. My, my mom told me. Her mom told her. Her mom told her. It must be right. We have to be in the business of asking some of these questions from time to time. Testing ourselves to see if what we believe about something is actually based on truth or is it just kind of a, a, a myth. 
Something that we, we think that's not actually founded in truth. You ever seen the show Mythbusters? Somebody? I, I had a clip, and it was only two minutes long, but I, I went against it. But Mythbusters, <laughs> the whole idea of the show is that they take an idea, something that's common, something that people believe, and they test it to see if it's true or if it's just a myth, a superstition. And the one that I was going to show was, uh, you know, in uh, the old comedy slapstick films where they always have the banana peel? Right, and the banana peel on the ground, and you fall down. And they said, let's test it. Now, the myth is one banana peel, one guy, equals comedy gold right away, right? And uh, they did do a thing where they had all these banana peels in this huge, big uh, little cage, and the guy was trying to run, and he did fall like ten times, and it was pretty funny. Um, but they finally figured out one banana peel, not as likely, so the myth was busted. So if you're watching any, you know, Charlie Chaplin films or Buster Keaton, they look good, right? Not exactly that true. So today we are going to be busting a few myths. We're going to be looking at how right here in Genesis, we're looking at a few different myths that the people are believing in, superstitions, and how ultimately those things don't help. They don't get us anywhere. They might make us feel good for a time, but they don't get us anywhere. There's industries that are based upon myths. There's industries that are based upon superstitions, right? Uh, we don't really have TV anymore, but I remember the commercials when I was growing up of Miss Cleo. Remember Miss Cleo? She said, call me now for your free tarot reading. You know, she had the cool Jamaican accent and everything, and you call her up, and she would tell you your future, tell you your fortune, right? tell you what you should do. And they make a lot of money off of stuff like that. Right? There are whole sections in bookstores on how to read your own palm and to read tea leaves and I don't know, all this kind of stuff. Because people go for it. People put their money in. They think that they can understand secret, hidden knowledge. But really, we're focusing on superstition and myth. And so we're going to get past that today. There are various levels of superstition in varying ways that they affect us and our thinking. As followers of Christ, however, we should desire to have our thinking conform to God's written revelation. We should constantly be examining our orthodoxy or, or what we proclaim to be true by the word of God. Because I think today we'll notice, and, and maybe as you think about this more, we have superstitions and myths even in the church that we need to think about and get past so as we're picking up our story now today, we've been looking at the life of Jacob. Let's just jump back and, and remind ourselves what has been going on in this story. Well, Jacob was fooled by his father-in-law Laban to work for seven years, not for the bride of his choice, Rachel, but for Leah. And so what has been going on is he's been spending seven years working off Rachel. And as he's been doing that, Laban has become very rich because of Jacob. Right? This is something that we see as a theme throughout the, the book of Genesis is that God's people always seem to also bring blessing to the people around them. Right? We think of, we'll get to it in, in a few months, Joseph, jo, uh, Jacob's son, a lot of names with Je Jacob's son, wherever he is, there seems to be blessing. Right? He's in Potiphar's house and there's great blessing there until the incident where he gets out of there. He ends up in the prison. And there's, he, he becomes the manager of the prison. Great blessing comes to him until eventually he becomes a great ruler in Egypt. And great blessing comes upon them because of God's man. Well, the same thing is happening here with Jacob in his working with Laban. Great blessing is coming upon Laban. So much so that when Jacob wants to leave, when he wants to take his own family and head out and make his own stake, make his own claim in the world, Laban says, no, 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 no. Don't do it. Because I know if you go, then all of this good blessing is going to leave me. And how does Laban know that? Well, let's pick up on our text. Genesis 30. Let's look at verse 36. I'm sorry, 26. Jacob says, Give me my wives and my children for whom I have served you, that I may go, for you know the service that I have given to you. Verse 27, but Laban said to him, if I found favor in your sight, I have learned by divination that the Lord has blessed me because of you. Name your wages. 
He says, stay, stay with me. Don't go anywhere because I'm doing so good because of you. And I know it's because of you because I went to Miss Cleo. <laughs> right? Because through divination, whatever means of divination they used, they figured it out. And what is divination? Well, it's any means that people use in order to gain hidden secret knowledge, either of the present, the past, or the future. So we have tarot cards. That's a, a, a common way that people do that. I was actually in a play called uh, No Time for Sergeants, and uh, we would be sitting backstage, and one of the guys in the play had tarot cards, and he, he would bring them to the play. It was the weirdest thing. Um, you see the little, what's this thing called? It's a little crystal thing, yeah. right? Some people put the little crystal on the, on the, the bracelet and the necklace thing, and they swing it, and it's going to either swing to the yes or the no if you're writing on the paper, and it's going to give you information, right? Ouija boards. Parker and Sons the, makes those. Isn't that interesting? Yeah, we make Monopoly, you know, we make a, a bingo game, and then we make Ouija boards. In order for you to communicate with the dead. Okay? Divination. Interesting, right? And that's, that's the attempt to gain knowledge that Laban has been using. This is what is common amongst these people. It's something that's common amongst us today. You open up any newspaper, what are you going to see in there? Horoscopes. Right? And some people can't go a whole day without reading their horoscope because they have to know what's been written in the stars for them. They have to know if it's a favorable day for them or not. Folks, this stuff is not only stupid, but it's dangerous. Because we end up putting so much faith in that garbage when our faith should be in God. There's instances where, remember when, when Saul wants, is it Saul? Yes, Saul wants to find out about something, so he wants to talk to Samuel the prophet. And so he goes to the witch, witch of Endor. The witch herself is surprised when, Saul, when Samuel appears. She's like, whoa. Right? Because she's making this stuff up. God interceded in order to teach a lesson at that point. There's this guy named James Randi. Anybody ever heard of James Randi? Yeah, okay. James Randi is, uh, he, he was a magician. And uh, he liked, what he does, he, he's, he's older now, but he did it for years and years. Um, he would offer money if anybody could prove they had any psychic ability. And right now, I think it's $10 million. If you can prove that you really can have some kind of psychic ability or do something, they'll pay you money. And he debunks all these people that try to do things. So whether it's dowsing for water with a little metal stick, or whether it's, say, you can read auras or whatever it is, he has all these experiments, and you can get online and watch a bunch of them, showing how it's all bogus. And these people, it's funny when they fail the test, because there's always some reason. Oh, well, I'm just um, not feeling strong right now. You know. There was a guy named Uri Geller. Anybody have heard of Uri Geller? He was famous for bending spoons. He did the spoon stuff, right? Um, the, uh, uh, Tonight Show. Who's the Tonight Show guy? Johnny Carson. Johnny Carson was a magician early in his career. And so he wanted to have Uri, Uri Geller come on his show. And so he called James Randi and said, what can I do? What can I do? And so he said, uh, supply your own props and don't let them touch them before they get there. And so there is this very awkward interview with Uri Geller sitting there. Johnny Carson sitting at the table said, all right, so are you going to try one of these things? Come on, do it. And the guy doesn't do anything the whole night. Right? But a lot of people not only believe that that stuff's real, but they look at these people like they're some kind of prophet. They will follow them anywhere because they have the power. They're the ones. But this stuff always lets us down. This stuff, it's as following our own imaginations, and it's not real, and it can become dangerous. Laban is trusting in this divination. He's trusting in that which is fake and false. But we also are going to see that Rachel, let's... If you say in this chapter, remember this, I didn't really look at it that much last week because it wasn't my main thrust, but um, in chapter 30, when we have the birth wars, look at verse 14 in chapter 30. 
It says, In the days of the wheat harvest, Reuben went and found mandrakes in the field and brought them to his mother Leah. Then Rachel said to Leah, Please give me some of your son's mandrakes. But she said to her, It is a small matter that you've taken away my husband. Would you also take my son's mandrakes also? Rachel said, Then he may lie with you tonight in exchange for your son's mandrakes. And you first read that and you go, What is that about? They're bargaining, so this is, again, why polygamy doesn't work. Okay, that just is interesting. But second, and I, I had to look into this a little bit, is mandrakes was, what's a myth? A myth was that those were help in fertility. That those had some kind of way where that's going to help her have a baby, and that's what Rachel wants, right? So she needs these mandrakes. She needs something because she can't trust in God anymore. She needs the mandrakes. She needs the superstition. It's it's. It's an interesting thing, but are we trusting in superstition? We have to ask ourselves that from time to time. When we're looking at our life and we're looking at where we put all of our attention, where we put our trust, are we trusting in God or are we trusting in superstition in this world? Later we're going to see Jacob himself, the one who God is using, is trusting in superstition. He's not actually trusting in God. So Laban says, stay with me. I found out by divination that you are the one bringing me all this blessing. And Jacob says, okay, I'll make you a deal. Let's make a deal. And he gives him this deal. He says, all right, here's what we'll do. All the speckled and, and striped sheep, all the goats and the ones that are not uh, pure black or pure white, those will be mine and I'll continue to watch over them. The other ones will be yours. We'll separate them, and so you'll know which ones are mine and which ones are yours. And again, this seems like a good deal to Laban. Remember, he made the good deal earlier about the seven years, and, and really seven years was extra long. It should have only been about three to four. So Jacob seems to be making good deals that Laban likes. So he says, sure, that's great. Let's do that. But... Laban, again, is not a very honest man, and so what he ends up doing is he has... His sons take those sheep and goats and separates them. And he doesn't leave uh, Jacob with what he said he was going to. And so now he's stuck with these sheep and goats that are not speckled and they're not spotted. So what is he going to do? Well, I kept reading this and I said, what is going on here? He takes sticks and he peels them. He takes the he peels them and so it exposes the white of the stick. He takes off the bark and he puts it in front of the goats and the sheep. And that's going to make them speckled and spotted. Now, I'm not a livestock expert. But I, I was at the state fair this year, so I'm pretty close. And I don't think that anybody there would recommend that if you want to have a speckled or spotted sheep, you peel a stick and put it in front of them. Because that, what would that do? Right? Nothing. Not only that, but he doesn't make the other ones look at the other ones. He turns them away so they don't look at each other. And you go, how, how does this do anything? How is this, how, how this going to help at all? How is this going to produce all the speckled and spotted sheep? The point is, it's not. It's not at all. It might seem like a good deal to Laban to do this. And so he comes in and he seems that Jacob is not going to do well. But what happens? It seems like this does work. Verse 41. It says in verse 41, Whenever the stronger of the flock were breeding, Jacob would lay the sticks in the troughs before the eyes of the flock that they might breed among the sticks. And then verse 43. So what's the outcome of it? Thus the man increased greatly and had large flocks. He had it all. It seemed to work. Funny thing is, is nobody uses that today to make your flock stronger. So what's going on here? I think that as Jacob is, is being taken advantage of, he, he continues to persevere. He raises the sheep, even though he sees that he has been fooled once again. However, he's trusting in his superstition and not in God. Because these sticks can do nothing. The way you face the animals really does nothing. The point, though, is that God is still working through Jacob, even though he's trusting in the wrong thing. God is still sovereign, even in this instance, and that has to be an important thing. Jacob prospers because God is sovereign, because God is in control. 
In spite of what Jacob is doing, God is working. This is what has to make us fall down and worship God at His amazing grace. Because not only does God lead us and direct us and guide us if we are His followers, but even when we're doing the wrong thing, He is leading us and directing us and guiding us. God's grace is more, uh, it's, it's more overarching and powerful than we could ever imagine. All-encompassing was the word I was looking for. It's all-encompassing. We get a view of this when we go to chapter 31. So follow me, Genesis 31. Verse 4. So Jacob sent and called Rachel and Leah into the field where his flock was and said to them, I see that your father does not regard me with favor as he did before, but the God of my father has been with me. Remember that word, but, in the Bible is awesome. Because it says, this is what is happening, but this is what God is doing. We were lost in our sins, broken. We were dead in our sins and transgressions. But God, when we were dead, made us alive with Christ. Jacob says, this is what your father is doing. He doesn't care about us. He's not taking care of us. He's lying. But God has been with me. That's something we have to recognize. Sometimes there's, there's things in the world that are going to go against us, whether it's something at work, maybe it's friends, maybe it's family, community. I, I don't know. We can say they did all of this to hate me, to push me down, all of this to get rid of me. But God, God is always there and God is always with me, even if I don't see it. Because when we're in chapter 30, we could ask Jacob, Jacob, how are you getting all these goats? Come on, tell the truth. He says, well, don't let this get out. But I broke some sticks. I'm actually going to patent it. This <laughs> is no. Because when he thinks back, he sees that God was always the one doing it. Look at verse 6, chapter 31. You know that I have served your father with all my strength, yet your father has cheated me and changed me ten times, my wages ten times. Again, but, but God did not permit him to harm me. If he said the spotted shall be your wages, then all the flock bore spotted. And if he said the striped shall be your wages, then all the flock bore striped. Thus God has taken away the livestock of your father and given them to me. He says, it was God the whole time. Now I look back. Laban says, okay, you can have all the spotted. Because probably there was only a few. It's like he spray painted them. But no, that's what they bore. God was actively working even in superstitious people. God is actively always doing that which glorifies himself in spite of us and our failings. The question is, can we act superstitious in the church? Even as followers of Christ, can we act superstitious? I think there's a few ways that we can. Right? If you've been a part of our Roman study or not, we've been looking at some of the things that the Apostle Paul has been saying. And one thing that I thought was great in the study guide we've been using, at one point, I believe it was in chapter 2 or 3, the study guide said, exchange the word circumcise with another church word, baptism, church membership, and then read the passage and see what would happen. And then you read it and it says, if you change it for baptism, baptism counts for nothing if you do not keep the whole law. Things like that. Because what we end up doing is, is we, especially with kids, we, we say, oh, we got to get them in the water. We got to get them in the water because that's the thing that's going to get them. And we feel like if we don't get them in the water, then they're never going to be saved and they're never going to have any chance. And if that's our idea, we should just get a fire hose every Sunday. Because <laughs> we're all dirty every Sunday. We don't recognize it's the grace of God that saves us. It's not the act of getting in a baptismal font and, 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 and doing that act. Now that's important and we don't want to belittle that. But that is to show us a reality of something that God has already done in our hearts. 
And I, I talk to older pastors and they say to me, you know, Nick, I, I, I almost regret 99% of the children I baptized. And they say that because they say, I look around and I say, Where, what happened to these kids? Where'd they go? Because sometimes we can be so quick to get them to say the words or to repeat the prayer after us or to get them in the water, not because we're, because we're in the superstition. We're not trusting in God to save. We care about that. We want kids to come to faith in Christ, but let's not be superstitious about it. God is the Savior. He's in control. He can save to the uttermost. He'll use us to do it. Hey, but in spite of everything that we did, and I I even says to the pastors, in spite of all that, God still works, right? Even in our failings. Jacob was being superstitious. God still worked. He came through. I'm sure there's many people that maybe they, they, they did go through the water when they were younger because that's what their parents made them do. But later they came to faith because God can work in our superstitions. Is our salvation based upon superstition or based upon what God has done for us in Christ? That's what we need to think about. That's what we're talking about in this Reformation time. This, 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 this Reformation celebration that God does not save because we do a ritual. But he saves because of his mercy and grace. And it is in Christ alone that we stand. It is in Christ alone that we have hope. In Christ alone that we can come be f- boldly before the throne of God. Because I can say, Lord, there's no, no, nothing in my hand I bring simply to the cross I cling. Because all of my good deeds are but filthy rags before you. We don't think about life as a superstition. We don't follow our superstitions, but we want to follow what God's word says. So today we can either be people who trust in myths and our imagination, or we can be people who trust in the living God. We can trust in the one who actually can save We're going to see more about Jacob and we're going to see how he's going to continue to mess up from time to time. But that's what God is in the business of doing. Taking mess up people and making them new. If he can do it for Jacob, he can do it for me and he can do it for you. And that's what makes his amazing grace so amazing. Let's pray. Lord, we are so thankful. So very thankful that even when we are are lost in in the myths of this world, Lord, you guide and direct your people. You don't leave us. You don't forsake us. You don't forget about us. But we can trust you. And may we, Lord, look at our life and see if we're holding on to things that are not according to your word. And may we just let them go. May we just get rid of them and reject them and turn more to you. May our faith not rest upon our own goodness. May our standing with you not rest upon our own goodness, upon our church attendance or our giving. But may our standing with you be because what you've done for us. The fact that Christ died upon a cross for us. That his precious blood was spilled.